Oh, Rob, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, so let's all give uh, Rob a round of virtual applause. And um, so, um, so uh, Professor Hoffman is with us uh, live online. So um, here are a couple of questions from our audience. Um, so uh, let me jump to question number 33. So to provoke everyone a little bit. So, so um, basically, um, the, the attendee is asking, how can we distinguish the true three-dimensional structure from the artifact caused by the missing wedge? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's a great question because the missing wedge is such a, a prominent part of electron tomography. That is, the, the missing wedge occurs because we can't collect projection angles or it's very difficult to collect projection angles over a hundred full 180 degrees. And that's, that's just a practical restriction due to the fact that the TEM holders will block the beam at high tilts or the sample itself. If it's loaded on a three millimeter round grid, eventually that grid, those grid bars get in the way. Of course, uh, one, one solution is to try and figure out how to prepare systems onto needle-like geometries that you can rotate 180 degrees. And that'd be the ideal scenario, but most systems we can only go, as we saw, plus or minus 70 degrees, so we miss a substantial amount of information. And in Fourier space, it's a wedge. So how that wedge manifests in our reconstructions, the easiest way to think of it is that it's a blurring in the direction of the missing wedge. That is, it's a resolution degradation. Our, our sample, uh, our reconstruction will smear out in that direction. So if we're thinking of, again, the Crowther criterion, which describes how resolution and missing information relate, and you need more projections. That's assuming you don't have a missing wedge. If you have a missing wedge, then in that particular direction, there's a resolution degradation. So uh, like all artifacts in tomographic reconstruction, you know, it, it, scientists have to be careful to, to discern the artifacts from what's real. And those artifacts can also be affected by the kinds of reconstruction algorithms you're using. So um, one way that researchers are innovating to, to reduce the size of the artifacts of, of these missing wedges is looking to new reconstruction algorithms. So among, among many to highlight, uh, one that has shown a lot of promise in the last couple of years is in this area of compressed sensing that was first introduced in the mathematics community by, by Candace and Tao in 2004. And then uh, Paul Midgley's lab demonstrated that it has applications in electron tomography in 2011. And while that poses new challenges to understanding the artifacts it presents, it seems to do a remarkable job at reducing the effects of the missing wedge. Um, but there's iterative uh, reconstruction methods that jump between real space and reciprocal space and a lot of other approaches out there trying to handle this missing wedge problem. So you always have to be careful of this. Uh, even if you don't have a missing wedge, it's, you don't have perfect reconstructions. So you, you have to have a careful eye. But in summary, uh, it's a loss of resolution in the direction of the missing wedge. Okay, great. So um, let me jump to question 38. Um, so what's the general time scale for STEM tomography, STEM EOS, I guess STEM EDX tomography? Um, what's the time for sample prep measurement and post data uh, treatment? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, these, these, all these talks you're, you're seeing uh, show beautiful 3D reconstructions. What's not shown is the extensive amount of time put in. Uh, we saw that data processing pipeline. Each one of those steps takes a substantial amount of time. When you're talking about stem tomography measurements, I mean, hours, um, people are working to make that higher throughput. If you add on top of that chemical mapping, you know, it can be substantially longer. A single, a single chemical map can take minutes to tens of minutes, um, depending on what you want to achieve. So you do that and you multiply it by the number of tilts. So you know, 30 to 100 tilts, it, it, it adds up very quickly if your sample can withstand it. And then the data processing, you know, you can spend days aligning your data set, you can spend days reconstructing your data set, and you can spend a very long time analyzing it. So uh, high throughput tomography is still a goal. And I think that goal is running in parallel with chemical tomography just more generally. Um, we're seeing great work being produced where EELS tomography and EDX tomography is, um, 
answering materials questions, but I, I think that that is still sort of state of the art research. Um, so high throughput EDX tomography, it, you know, at lower resolution, these things could run, could, could be achieved uh, in, in the span of a day or two, but more typically I'd say, you know, a week is a more realistic timeline. Cool. So let me jump to um, question number 41. So uh, I'm going to rephrase this a little bit. So um, basically, uh, Yanan asked, can we get 3D spectrum? So I'm going to expand it a little bit. So basically, how do we more efficiently utilize multi-channel tomography data set or even multimodal? You have yeah. STEM, you have STEM yield, STEM EDS, all of them combined together. Cool. Yeah. So uh, when we saw that st stem diagram, you saw that a lot of the detectors weren't in the way of each other. They're not mutually exclusive. So we can collect an ADF signal. We can collect an EEL spectrum. We can collect an EDX spectrum. And if we could manage all that data, we could collect all of it simultaneously and use it in a useful way. Um, that would be current, current state of the art research. Um, I think that those are great questions. Um, when you're doing these chemical tomography experiments, you have a choice. You could either try and reconstruct the 3D spectrum, or you could pre-process the spectra to collect the chemical signatures you want, and then reconstruct um, each chemical signal separately in 3D. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not actually sure which wins out in terms of signal to noise, but so that that that'd be an interesting question. But um, you could you could take either approach. Okay, cool. So um, I'm gonna jump to uh, number uh, question number fifty. Uh, so so the the attendee is asking us to um, compare X-ray tomography uh, to electron tomography one we start talking about fast real-time electron tomography. So is it worth developing um, high temporal resolution electron tomography? Absolutely. Uh, fast, fast tomography would be great. We need to have, uh, uh, it's, it depends on what you're talking about. So we'll, um, this talk focused mostly on stem tomography because it, it gives us lots of, um, uh, it gives us these directly interpretable projection images. Um, but as, as mentioned, you can do so this broad illumination TEM tomography, you run into other problems, uh, contrast, uh, phase contrast inter interferes with these projection requirements. Um, but that's one avenue to go is to try and use TEM tomography to do very fast reconstruction. If you're talking about stem tomography, um, that's difficult, especially chemical tomography, because these scans take a long time and then you have to take multiple projections. So I'm not sure how it will be solved uh, with chemical tomography, but um, I think we're going to see as the data processing throughput improves, as detectors improve, as stage um, sensitivity, that is, um, stages are more precise, we We'll, we'll likely see higher throughput tomography that will ultimately lead into some kind of re real time or temporal tomography. I, I believe that uh, X-ray is ahead of the TEM community in this regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely there's a lot of room for improvement uh, for us to catch up. So um, question number 51. So um, this one is uh, a, a quite a general uh, question. So what is a typical sample size? What uh, for electron tomography? How large can we go? How small can we go? Yeah, so that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, so I think we want to, we're going to see a wonderful talk uh, next by, by Professor Mao, UCLA, where he has pushed into high resolution in a remarkable, a remarkable way. We also saw in this talk that pushing to chemical spectroscopy is also uh, a pioneering uh, uh, efforts in, in electron tomography, but also trying to do those things over large objects while also preserving high resolution is another goal. Um, so there's a trade-off. Uh, the Crowther criteria, we saw that more projections are needed if you want to do larger objects and higher resolution. So we battle against the Crowther criteria, uh, and then we also battle against the depth of focus of our, of our convergent beam. So objects will start to go in and out of focus at different points. So that can limit our uh, field of view. 
the size of objects we can reconstruct. So if you don't, if you're the, if you're trying to do sort of nanoscale tomography, which is the focus of, of this talk, your objects can be hundreds of nanometers in size. If it's too thick, so if you're talking about thick lamella structures, you don't want to have lots of multiple scattering. Um, but if you're talking about nanoparticles dispersed, dispersed on like a 3D carbon support, like we saw in the case of, of those fuel cell materials, you know, they can be very large. Um, so mm -hmm. you can go microns and in, in, uh, micron in field of view. Yeah, so essentially is how, how scattering your samples are determines the th uh, how, how thick you can work with. Okay, That's right. so um, going to uh, question number 55. So, um, so what about the relaxation between time and tools? Can you reduce the number of tools you use while still preserving the fidelity or the resolution? Um, so I'm not sure I understand what relaxation time um, is. That stage relaxation? Yeah, yeah, I think that it means stage relaxation. Okay, yeah, because hopefully there's not charging effects. If you have things like your beam is charging your sample and causing drift, those are harder to deal with. Um, between stage, uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't know the details of the stage mechanics, but we, we usually let things relax before we do the tomography experiment. And then we progress in one direction as to remove backlash in the stage. That is, if you're going back and forth, uh, things don't move at even steps, uh, predictable even steps in your goniometer. So we go in one direction, and once we've... Um, uh, things stabilize pr pretty quickly. By the time we're able to focus, uh, refocus our sample, we're, we're, we're stable. So usually we'll stabilize in the beginning, let everything equilibrate uh, our specimen or holder uh, yeah. to the temperature of the room in the microscope. Perfect. So question number 54 is a good uh, concluding question. Um, so what technical software skills would you say are most important for the data analysis required for STEM tomorrow? Um, yes, yeah, so, so you, we use a, you know, we're, we're, we develop algorithms in Python and MATLAB. Um, we try and share it in Python since it's more open. Um, so you need to be able to work with three-dimensional matrices um, and work uh, in real space and Fourier space. There are software tools like we, we, I shared, uh, ToneViz, that's making that more accessible, building graphical interfaces around the things uh, you need to do tomography. So I'm uh, as a um, one of the co-developers of ToneViz, along with a colleague Marcus Hanwell. I would absolutely promote that software. Um, it's open source too, so you know I don't get anything out of it other than uh, uh, broadening the number of tomography users. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, uh, Couple of one small question I saw early on. Um, so, um, and in your talk, you talk about the platinum nanoparticle in and out on the on the support uh, of carbon support. Can you elaborate how tomography differentiates between exterior and interior particles? Yeah, I saw that question. That's a it's a good question because that question highlights the challenges of segmentation. That is even once you have a good reconstruction, so everything went really well and you got this beautiful reconstruction of your system, how do you analyze it? How do you figure out particle size, statistics, surface area, volume ratios? All of these things can be, can be different and they can be very specific to the systems that you're studying. So in this case, the question was, how do we distinguish particles on the interior next year? So one, the simplest is do it by eye. It's one data set, you already spent a week on it. You could go and label each individual nanoparticle. But if you're trying to do it more generally, then you have to create automated segmentation algorithms. So the first thing you would do is you you distinguish, you threshold to distinguish the values above a certain threshold associated with the platinum, those associated with the carbon, those associated with the background. And you'd say, okay, well, does my does the values of my platinum particle then you do some morphological rule to decide my platinum has an exterior region and an interior region. And you'd say, do my platinum coordinates lie within that region or with the outside of that region? And that would be an automated approach. But all of these segmentation algorithms can be non-trivial. It's, it's thresholding usually requires additional morphological operators, watershed algorithms. Um, you can, you can go down a rabbit hole, you know, it's, it, it's turtles all the way down when you get into segmentation. 
Great, Rob. Thank you very much for answering all these excellent questions. Um, so let's all give uh, uh, Dr. Rob Hoffman another round of applause.